thank you, Nick, for the invitation. And again, it's 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 great to be uh, be here and part of this um, um, session. I wanted to kind of uh, talk, build up on some of uh, of what uh, David and Andrew have been talking about, and and uh, really. Um, present some thoughts and ideas about how do we take a lot of the interesting measurements that um, the mobile sensing and sensing community broadly have been doing in, in measuring um, aspects of mental health to really how, how do we use it? Um, and, and that's something that I've been uh, very interested in from, from the beginning and I've been thinking about it uh, more and more as how should we use these uh, novel signals and and how do we also compensate for some of the limitations of these signals? So um, if we think about kind of overall where, where these types of uh, different mobile assessment and continuous sensing can play a role is in, in threefold, right? Where one is being able to continuously uh, collect um, assessment and measurement and doing objective uh, assessment or even in the mental health context, like delivering measurement-based care, um, we've been always um, limited in the types of measurement that we get and often require um, uh, putting burden on, on the individuals themselves. So that's kind of one area where um, their uh, uh, mobile sensing and, and measurement uh, kind of novel um, sensor-based measurement can play a big role. And um, it's been a huge area where there has been a lot of kind of research and exploration. Uh, and then the next is that how do we use this uh, measurement um, to do um, really um, useful prediction that is also um, robust and, and scalable and something that um, David touched on. And, and finally, it's, it's thinking about once you once you do this prediction, how can it be used in delivering care? And I think this is an area where we have the least amount of um, kind of research uh, in so far. And I think it's going to be very important of thinking about how how do we uh, leverage it in in not just on the individual personalized um, intervention, but also um, enabling. Uh, in the clinical side, delivering better care and how do we effectively use it while um, balancing uh, the burden that one would put to the uh, clinical care team in terms of using the data and effectively making decisions based on that. So um, how, how do we make this information actionable? And with that, I, I kind of want to break it into some of some of the gaps that existed and where uh, these uh, new types of measurement and, and sensing and assessment can can play a role. So the biggest one has been in addressing uh, what uh, what I'd say is the measurement gap, right? Like it, it is it has been hard to continuously assess the state of someone uh, suffering from uh, mental uh, illness or um, and, and capture it in, in time or early enough to, to take action. But, um, uh, and these, these symptoms happen as we go about in, in our daily lives, as we live our lives, as our lifestyle changes, and both of something that Andrew and, and uh, David mentioned, and uh, we even hear it in, in the context of patients that we see uh, the changes or uh, from, from their baseline or healthy state in terms of sleep, in terms of activities, in terms of uh, mobility and location, and, and also um, just the rate at which how we uh, kind of do things in terms of speaking rate and walking rate and all the, the, uh, the psychomotor aspects. And we can, uh, these types of information has been become easier, easier to collect um, with, with um, smartphones for, uh, for sure, right? There is over 3 billion smartphones in the world now, but also with the slew of other solutions that we are seeing, right? In terms of uh, sensors that are embedded in our household and, and things that we wear that are becoming increasingly more um, affordable, comfortable, and accurate. And what we can get from that is um, really um, 
data about various aspects of behavior that we think are clinically useful in, in modeling uh, mental health and, and try to tie it to um, individual patient trajectories and also how we want to, um, in terms of predicting scores, which is something that um, David mentioned, like how, how do we see kind of consistency in predicting something like PHQ. Now, uh, one of the things that um, I, 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 I want to highlight here is, um, and which is something that David also mentioned, uh, that these data, uh, they're going to be noisy. Um, they're going to vary from individual to individual or groups or cluster to cluster. And there are some signals that might be more robust, like the location um, and mobility uh, Kind of characteristics that David mentioned, and some are going to be maybe more useful for a certain period of time and less useful in other periods of time. Um, but one of the things that we need to pay more attention to, I think, is um, all of us often tend to work in our areas of expertise. I do a lot of stuff with mobile and, and sensor data, um, and um, uh, there are there is rich body of work with natural language, and um, there's also um, work with uh, with kind of brain signals and fMRI. And as as we saw, that both kind of work that is trying to pull those together. But I think one of the things that is still um, a gap is how how do we use some of the existing kind of uh, data and uh, combine it with new types of data and also know when to trust which data stream and, and for who. And I think that's still an active area of research where um, as, we, as we scale and want to see how it scales, we need to understand um, that not only one size fits all, one data doesn't fit all and there will be variability and how do we pick and choose. And if we kind of think about even in a clinical care when a clinician is treating a patient and they look at their PHQ score, they look at their body language, they look at their medical record, they may Make a judgment on how to kind of weigh those information to make their clinical assessment. Right now, I would say, and from the measurement perspective, we still don't have that, and we need to uh, we need to be able to um, get there. And I think that's an open open area of research, and uh, both uh, both in terms of um, new types of data, but also on on the clinical. Um, care data that we could get. And I think that's that still remains a big gap because a lot of times um, to collect this data in practice and use it in clinical care, we want to have enough uh, validation and to get the validation, we need to actually pull these things together. And it's almost like a chicken and an egg problem and something that we need to kind of think about of how do we, how do we address that. And then the question is, the um, next thing that I want to is that how is this data going to be used? Um, again, not only uh, which data to use and where, where to pay attention to or shine the spotlight on, but um, how do we um, combine the clinical uh, the technical advances that we are making in with the clinical needs and how do we share information back and forth so that it again can be can be useful so this is kind of like how do we create a more continuous bridge between not that we just do the research and publish paper and it gets used but i think in a lot of these work we need to actually go back and forth to generate the validation and and the best way to to use it um, and i'll give you one example of uh, area that we, we learned a lot from and Andrew was involved as well is, is a, uh, data collection and a kind of modeling effort that we did in terms of detecting um, uh, mental health changes and uh, identifying relapse with individuals uh, with schizophrenia. And I'm not going to kind of um, go into too much of the details. It was a year long data collection with kind of smartphone data some of that Andrew presented in his COVID study. Uh, but one of the goals uh, is to kind of think about how do we actually uh, 
pull out the predictive um, signals and handle variability. And along the lines that David mentioned in terms of the temporal aspect, um, that is that was very important and that allows us to deal with the, the variability that we see. And one of our hypotheses there was that um, if an individual is um, uh, to experiencing change in their mental health, we will see kind of a deviation from their uh, normal behavior and then our, or their uh, behavior that they exhibit when they're relatively healthy and how much deviation there is and the intensity of that deviation is going to be indicative um, of, of changes in mental health. And that's kind of what we try to um, test using um, a, a deep learning model and the details of that are, aren't important where we say that if we take data from the relative uh, days of relative health and want to predict um, what their behavior would look like in the future, if things are changing, right, there will be a, a bigger deviation from what the model predicts and, um, uh, and that deviation is going to be indicative. And that is useful in the context of in a lot of these cases, um, severe changes or relapse episodes are infrequent or rare Event, right? And you, we don't have a lot of training data. Of course, there are ways of kind of uh, trying to compensate for that. But if we have more um, uh, data from dates of kind of relative health, by looking at the deviation and the intensity of deviation, we might be able to uh, predict change. And in our data set, what we saw is that here in the x-axis, zero is the relapse um, uh, period. And almost a month before, you see behavior starting to change and the intensity of the behavior is also changing. And kind of going back to David's point that there is um, there might be location feature and changes across different people, but here also we are able to kind of accommodate that different people might exhibit different features right we are looking at these anomalies across multiple dimensions and trying to pull together to get at how uh, how, how do they kind of um, factor in together and and the, the the kind of strength of that signal so I think that's one thing that is important for us to kind of think about is how do we take this data, which we know are going to be different from the individuals and over time, and it can be even different for the same individual over time, but still build something that could apply from a modeling perspective or a modeling approach perspective across the board. And finally, the thing that, um, and this is kind of showing that we saw even like a doubling of these anomalies, but the, finally, I want to end by kind of talking about that really, um, we talk about in, when it comes to machine learning, uh, explainability, explainable AI, interpretability. But if you think about a lot of um, uh, solutions, right? Like for example, when we take a blood pressure measurement, we don't want to know how the circuits of the blood pressure device works, right? Or when you do a blood test, you don't want to know all the, 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 the physics and chemistry of the blood test itself. You want to know that, that the results the doctor can take action on, right? So although I think in, uh, explainability and interpretability is a very important component, actionability is also extremely important. For example, if we could consistently say that we could give data that is predictive of changes in mental health, and um, these are the actions that could help it, it's gonna be useful, even if, you, if a doctor didn't understand all the details of the machine learning algorithm, right? Um, you need to be able to delve down to a certain level, but there is also a certain level of explainability that probably the doctors won't even have time to delve into. So that's kind of something that I've been, uh, I've been uh, thinking about quite a lot and, and have been uh, partnering with not only um, researchers in the clinical side, but also practitioners that how do we uh, create, um, leverage these signals and, and pull it together in existing systems to actually create the, a learning system that can be used in a clinical context. And I, I kind of mentioned the, the beginning, like one of the uh, recently, one of the um, um, the things I've been involved in is is kind of thinking about a lot of kind of insurance companies are thinking about virtual care and remote monitoring. This is an ideal platform of building signals. Can we actually 
um, uh, create um, these leverage the signals of clinical action. So one of the projects that um, I want to mention that I've been driving with uh, one of my clinical kind of uh, partners in the project, Cecilia Lipsy, who uh, was the head of integrated behavioral care at Penn and now working, we're working together at Optum Labs, is to say, can we incorporate these types of signals into delivering technology-assisted integrated care, where there's already a lot of evidence showing that integrated care delivers can deliver better outcome um, at better cost point. Um, and it's been difficult to scale because of measurement issues and, and not being able to, um, it's very human intensive. So what we are building is trying to create a, a platform. And again, there also cannot just have everyone wear a specific type of device. Can we create platform agnostic data capture that can take some of these behavioral signals we are talking about, but combine it with um, existing data sources, including data that um, um, the doctor already is collecting or insurance companies might have to know how to balance this data to get the best prediction. But ultimately, a big focus in clinical use is how can it support in clinical decision making. So that's that's something that I think we need to put this together to be able to really know how to use it in clinical practice. And um, if, if you're interested in this, in this project, I'm going to put a plug in uh, like David, uh, please reach out because we are uh, at their early stages of really kind of building uh, this solution out. And ultimately, I think uh, we, we really can enable a future of integrated care with continuous measurement, prediction, and intervention. And along those lines, in my Cornell role, I also kind of driving a precision behavioral health initiative where we are doing a lot of the research um, in this space. And with that, I want to kind of thank um, collaborators, students, and, and funders that have supported a lot of the research. Thank you very much.